Okay, uh, welcome all to the Thomas Jefferson chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians Spring 2018 lecture. I'm Kelsey Dutson, the outgoing academic chair, and tonight we present Travis McDonald. Travis is the director of architectural restoration at Poplar Forest, Thomas Jefferson's retreat home out, located outside of Lynchburg, Virginia, which I think most of most everyone in here knows that. Um, he, Travis is, a, is also a member of the un University of Virginia Historic Preservation Advisory Committee. Travis received his master's in architectural history from UVA in 1980. He has been with Poplar Forest for about 30 years overseeing the restoration of Poplar Forest. During this time also he leads an architectural history field school at the beginning of each summer which he will talk about at the end of his lecture. Because of Travis's work at Poplar Forest, he is often consulted on historic properties. One of his most recent projects has been for the Ann Spencer House in, Lynchburg, in downtown Lynchburg, Virginia. In his talk, The Genius of Place and Space, Ann Spencer's Autobiographical Creation in Lynchburg, Virginia, he discusses the relationship between her writing and the discussion of, and the construction of her house. Without further ado, here is Travis. Thank you, Kelsey. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, this, uh, what I'm going to present tonight is a larger version of a talk I gave at the Vernacular Architecture Forum last year. Uh, and after that, they asked me to expand it into a, a larger article. So this is a shorter version of the <laughs> article that's going to come out sometime this fall in the Vernacular Architecture uh, Journal. Um, so uh, you already know the answer, but if I had asked you which other autobiographical house in Lynchburg was just as significant is Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest. You probably wouldn't know the answer. Uh, you know it now, but this, I really do think this is as significant nationally as Poplar Forest. And I'll try to tell you why. <coughs> um, see if we can. So, uh, Ann Spencer, who lived from 1882 to 1975, was an African-American high school librarian in Lynchburg who became nationally known, if not for her own choosing, as a poet of the Harlem Renaissance during the 1920s. The 1903 house that Ann built with her husband Edward is now a National Register property and a Virginia landmark property. It's known principally for its personal and eclectic interior and its restored flower garden that evolved over a 62-year period. This essay considers how to interpret this remarkable yet little-known historic site based on the fact that it represents an artistic and architectural creation that is inextricably based on and exhibiting the ephemeral characteristics of flowers and poetry. Fieldwork at the Ann and Edward Spencer House prompts questions about how and why we record what we record. The site defies typical interpretations and even the wide net approaches found in the VAF's invitation to vernacular architecture. In this case, many of the fields through which architectural history is now studied overlap. Ethnicity, sorry, gender, class, race, sociology, feminism, and economics. A Venn diagram of intersecting subjects at this site would thicken with the major themes of architecture, art, interior decorating, decorative arts, craftsmanship, material culture, gardening, and poetry. The diversity of new fields and the range of subjects within those fields have led to a broader but more fragmented field of architectural history. Del Upton characterized architecture as the art of social storytelling 
a means for shaping America, society, and culture. That is surely the more public macro lens through which we could see the Spencer site. Upton also acknowledged that in some cases, architecture was a vehicle of individual aesthetic expression. This is the more challenging private micro lens through which to see the Ann Spencer creation. What is particularly challenging to confront in this creation is how the ephemeral and ever-changing essence of Ann Spencer's garden found expression both in her poetry and in her interior decorations and furnishings. Anne managed to describe the colors, smells, and textures of flowers in words, saying, Earth, I thank you for the pleasure of your language. She effectively used poetry for capturing the nuances of nature, but describing the poetry of colors, patterns, and textures of an interior setting inspired by the same ephemeral beauty of nature challenge, challenges our typical interpretive conventions. There are literary and artistic shrines that evoke the autobiographical nature of a writer's or an artist's home and garden, yet none have the symbiotic spirit and presence of poetry, flowers, and art and architecture that define the Spencer house and garden. While Anne Spencer's poetry and gardening have been studied to an extent, the house itself has been minimally documented before I took on what I thought would be a modest task of recording the interior and advising on restoration issues. The authenticity of the house rests on the fortunate circumstance that it was left virtually intact as a museum when Ann Spencer died in 1975. I began to realize that the description of Ann Spencer's garden and poetry, described as subtle, original, richly nuanced, and carefully crafted, was equally true for the architecture, decoration, and furnishings. What makes this site and story even more unusual and significant for all these familiar themes are the overlaying filters of social, cultural, educational, political, and racial context of an African-American family's pursuit of happiness in a small traditional southern city in the early 20th century. The liberating equality and dignity achieved through this family's accomplishments was private and public. It was local and national. It was unique and popular. Understanding this site as a unique autobiographical domestic creation poses one fieldwork question. The other is I'm sorry, uh, the other is how the site fits into a larger social, cultural, and architectural landscape, particularly in terms of race. In other words, how does it reflect the many studies and interpretations of the iconic single American house in America. Anne Bannister Spencer was born in 1882 on a rural plantation in Henry County, Virginia, to Joel Bannister, a former slave, and Sarah Scales, who was the daughter of a prominent slave owner and one of his slaves. After her parents separated, Anne's mother moved to the coal fields of Bramwell, West Virginia, to find work. And Anne boarded there with a prominent black family who informally taught her to read at the age of nine. Sarah's ambitions for her daughter led Anne to enter the Virginia Theological Seminary and College in Lynchburg in 1893 at the age of 11. She graduated six years later with a liberal arts education in history, literature, math, science, Latin, French, and German. A four-volume set of the writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson that Anne received shortly after graduation was said to be a major influence on her life and her work as a poet. Anne returned to Bramwell as a pioneering African-American teacher, working there for several years before moving back to Lynchburg to teach for the seminary. In 
In 1901, she married former seminary student Edward Spencer, and after raising three children, Anne served from 1923 to 1945 as the first female librarian at the segregated Dunbar High School in Lynchburg. If for no other reason, Anne would be remembered as the well-educated librarian who opened the first library for African Americans in the city and who inspired many students through her erudition and extensive personal library that she shared with school children. But these are only the backstory accomplishments for which she is not publicly remembered. Anne and her husband lived in what appears to be a fairly conventional 1903 Queen Anne style house in a suburban neighborhood street with a restored garden in the backyard. What makes the house and neighborhood different is that it was an Afri African American enclave surrounded by a white neighborhood. This area was formerly Camp Davis, a Civil War campground that later became a Freedmen's Bureau refuge for freed slaves. Beginning in the 1870s, African Americans bought part of this land and developed houses, businesses, and churches. Warwick Spencer and his sons, Edward and Warwick Jr., developed part of Pierce Street in this area that was known as Spencer Place, and they constructed a number of houses on the, in this neighborhood. The house Edward and Anne constructed at 1313 Pierce Street next to Warwick's house was in this fashionable African-American neighborhood. This is now the National Register Pierce Street Renaissance District, boasting of eight Virginia state historical markers in its two-block area that pays homage to significant African-American educators, musicians, physicians, athletes, architects, aviators, civil rights pioneers, and civic leaders who lived there during the 20th century. And this is just a few of the people, two uh, pioneers in African-American education. Uh, this is Amelia uh, um, Pride, who started a what you could call a uh, old folks home for uh, former female slaves. Uh, this is Dr. Johnson, who, uh, in addition to being a uh, pioneer in African-American medicine, put a clay tennis court next to his house and started a camp where he took in young black men and women and taught them how to play tennis. Uh, two of his notable successes were Althea Gibson and um, um, Sean, help me. Arthur Ashe, sorry. Uh, 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 maybe more to your interest, this is one of the first, if not the first, African-American architect, studied at Columbia, and later designed a Bauhaus-style house for herself. Uh, she lived in the neighborhood. Uh, on a less happy note, Oda Binga, the uh, Congolese pygmy who had been shown in a New York zoo uh, finally found his way to Lynchburg and uh, was tutored by Ann Spencer. And then Chauncey Spencer, Ann's son, who was uh, really responsible for getting African Americans into aviation uh, just before World War II and went on to have a stellar career, uh, including one of the founders of the Tuskegee Airmen. So uh, this American dream suburban neighborhood looked like many of the contemporary white neighborhoods of the segregated city, but it was racially separate but architecturally equal. So how unusual was this in Lynchburg or elsewhere at the time? Did living in this neighborhood make a difference for African-American families as opposed to those who lived in the older neighborhoods of hand-me-down houses left by white families moving to the suburbs. While the Spencer's house looked typical on the exterior, it was a unique artistic creation on the interior. And just uh, give you a little tour. Um, 
of the first floor. Uh, you can see the entry hall here. I'm going to go in this order. This is the entry hall, the back entry hall with its um, nook and its early telephone uh, nook, the parlor, the dining room, the kitchen, and the sunroom, which was an addition. So on the second floor, uh, we have the master bedroom, a guest bedroom, another guest bedroom, and we have the on the upper left the upper addition of the sunroom addition, the bathroom, and up in the attic, uh, Edwards kind of man cave where he had a billiard table. Edwards' position as Lynchburg's first African-American parcel postman led him to collect bits and pieces of discarded architectural parts around town for use in the house and garden. Discarded parts were innovatively reused throughout the house, on the staircase, in windows, on the roof, for metal wainscot, in the billiard room, as radiator covers, in the entry hall alcove for kitchen windows and cabinets, in the garden, at the cottage, and pasted on walls and floors and every other place in the house. These architectural features of the house in turn became the canvas for Anne's artistic talents inspired by the bold and flamboyant combination of colors and textures of the garden the constant revisions, enlargements, recrafting, and refinements that characterize Anne's poetry and gardening for several 70 years mirror and are mirrored in the 1903 house. These interior spaces display a chronological and stratigraphic record on floors, walls, ceilings of the ever-changing colors, textures, wallpapers, and textiles. One of the hard things about interpreting this house is to figure out which layers go with other layers. Cut out portions of wallpaper or textile fabrics were glued and mixed with other forms and designs on walls and furniture. Anne's good friend and former neighbor, the African-American woman who was the modernist architect, Amaza Lee Meredith, contributed to the decor with murals and tile work. Anne's poem, Lines to a Nasturtium, was hand-painted on a kitchen cabinet by Meredith. Anne's poetry was written on walls, kitchen cabinets, in the phone booth, and on every conceivable paper or cardboard surface. A painted mural called The Cocktail Party was a wry social commentary reserved for an upstairs bedroom wall. Chinese papers and fabrics of bright colors sometimes determine the room scheme. Another bedroom featured a small tribute to Anne's native Indian heritage with a map by African-American artist Louise Jefferson pasted on the wall. In that same room, painted Mexican furniture coexists with Anne's hand-painted furniture and decorative arts objects that match the room's final color scheme. A portrait of Anne's grandfather, a plantation owner who had fathered Anne's enslaved grandmother, references a different heritage. The dining room suite must have been the one expensive and up-to-date commodity indulgence. An arts and crafts set of stickly pieces in a floral design is probably one of the showy parts of the house, uh, along with all the other reused portions. Edward created his own space in the attic where he played billiards with friends. The attic later became the domain of many grandchildren who came to visit. The house expanded in the 1950s with a family sunroom overlooking the garden that provided extra informal space for visitors and guests. The upper story of this addition was another light-filled room overlooking the garden for extra bedroom space 
for a growing family. Probably at the time of this addition, the exterior took on a more craftsman look when wood shingles were placed over the original weatherboards. The house was a lively conversation of eclectic forms, finishes, furnishings, being Victorian, Edwardian, Queen Anne, Gothic Revival, Renaissance Revival, Art Deco, Art Nouveau, Chinoiserie, Aesthetic Movement, and Arts and Crafts. I'd like to find that somewhere else. <clears throat> this bespoke dwelling reflected the popularized suburban ideal and the important social aspects of property ownership and architectural pride. Anne wrote, we have a lovely house, one that money did not buy. It was born and evolved slowly out of our passionate, poverty-stricken agony to own our own home, our own happiness. In his book, Architecture in Suburbia, historian John Archer suggests that the American dream house is elusive but tied to a mix of personal and private opportunities and goals related to the long history of the individual dwelling and the development of the individual self. Del Upton reiterated the importance of that American icon, the single family house, and said that it claims a place for the individual and the family in time and space, time being history, space being community. But this was not a typical family or community house. Anne's personal eclectic taste was inspired by popular home and garden arbiters of fashion, including Better Homes and Gardens, House Beautiful, American Home, House and Garden, Country Life, Garden and Home Builder, The Delineator, and the Arts and Decoration and, and Home Garden. The poetic assemble, ensemble of textures, colors, fabrics, materials, art, and furnishings of the house on the interior related to and ins were inspired by the garden and makes this a unique personal creation hard to define or to interpret. But to analyze the building and landscape without knowledge of Anne's poetry or her gardening and her social and political activism would miss the key factors that explain the building and its owner's historical significance. Anne's poetry was derived from nature, from the outdoor rooms and the seasonal changes of the garden, and from the characteristics of individual flowers and plants. This peaceful and beautiful oasis became the intimate setting and context that shaped the relationship between family, friends, colleagues, artists, writers, and national civil rights leaders. In searching for some type of framework to make sense of the confluence of these cultural spheres, I turned to Henry Glassie's pioneering work as a means of trying to understand such intangible factors that I felt unequipped to consider. Glassie's ethnological approach to understanding vernacular houses relied on interviews of builders and occupants to learn the social process of a dwelling. While there are historians' interviews with Ann Spencer before she died, and her house and garden have been faithfully preserved and restored, an ethological approach along the lines of Glassie's would provide a useful starting point for a richer understanding of the site if its creators were still alive. Glassie believed that the exterior of a house appeals to the intellect and is more rational, while the interior, quote, comforts the body and delights the senses. Soft seats and titillating array of textiles, patterns, and colors. The weary bones find rest. The eye finds excitement as a device for communication, unfolding from the householder's interest and taste. The interior stimulates engagement. This seemed a very accurate uh, description for the feeling inside the Spencer house with the engagement even extending into the garden rooms. 
Glassie's description of a phase of cultural transformation in vernacular houses as a commodity also seemed true of the Spencer House. This was the moment when houses themselves became commodities and people were assigned the difficult task of shaping their personalities out of things made by other people. Was this a different example of the single family house that is said to reflect an individual portrait of its occupants? Did the Victorian ideology hold true here that the interior of a house and its garden was the province and domain of the woman, or was this a different story in some way? Anne created, Anne referred to her garden as half my world and mentioned the Greek god Antaeus as a reference to her strength coming from contact with the earth. As a woman of color, she could not benefit from the early garden clubs in Lynchburg, but taught herself from popular home and garden magazines. Her early influences, she said, were roaming the woods and streams as a young girl, and she and Edward would also collect native plants for the garden. Anne created a compact series of garden rooms, including the rose garden, the cottage garden, the arbor garden, and the pool garden, each defined by recycled architectural parts, including the African Igbo tribe metal head given to her by W.E.B. Du Bois and used for the fountain at the lily pond. Anne's garden cottage, her personal and creative sanctuary, built by Edward with reused parts, was named Ed and Crawl, a combination of Ed and Anne and crawl, an African's word connoting a cultural recognition of the past or a safe enclosure. There she could retreat when tired, frustrated, sad, or satisfied. The other significant intellectual retreat in Lynchburg, of course, was Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest, which Anne might have known about but would not have ever seen. Anne's small, intimate cottage of just 240 square feet served a similar purpose as Jefferson's, an intellectual sanctum sanctorum, where her, her, her literary muse found strength and inspiration surrounded by the nurturing nature of her garden. The garden also functioned as a family and social space and as an outdoor salon for her notable guest. Anne wrote of her garden, this small garden is half my world. I am nothing to it. When all is said, I plant the thorn and kiss the rose, but they will grow when I am dead. Rebecca Prishkorn in Reuben Rainey's book, and Reuben is here tonight, uh, on the Spencer Garden, describes the centuries-old connection between garden sanctuaries and poetry, saying, quote, often the engaging presence of the garden itself its processes of growth, decay, transformation, its sounds, textures, tastes, fragrances, and visual delights touch the deepest levels of the human spirit and quicken the poetic imagination. The language of the poet is infused with an alchemy of the garden. The garden both shelters and cultivates the poet. Anne and Edward Spencer's architectural creation was no less alchemy. The genius of the place was a fusion of poetry, gardening, and architectural settings that reflected the complex intellect of its creators. The statement about Anne's outdoor world seems a perfect metaphor. Quote, a garden is a tapestry of relationships between those of design and care for the garden. Those who visit and appreciate it and the garden itself. This was both a private and personal sanctuary and a safe, stimulating refuge for visiting public figures in the midst of public and racial strife. Unlike the house, the garden needed restoration after Anne's death and was lovingly and expertly restored under the direction of Jane White and the Lynchburg Hillside Garden Club in 1983 to 85. White's book, Lessons Learned from a Poet's Garden, details the challenging nuances of this garden restoration based on physical evidence, photographs, 
and documents. Anne's garden resembles a cottage garden in many ways and had the elements of both formal and natural aspects. Like the interior, Anne had drawn ideas from magazines, but her gardening style was all her own. Certain features could be considered vernacular, African-American forms, but are not obviously so. The imaginative use of recycled materials, brilliant flower colors, the use of native plants, and as an intimate family and neighboring space. The Spencer Garden can now be experienced as the indispensable natural realm with which to understand and interpret the poetry and the choices for interior decoration. As devices for communication and for stimulating engagement, Anne and Edward's personal, personally shaped spaces, both inside and out, might be more nationally significant as the setting for some of the intimate and human, humanistic conversations, although unrecorded, that finally define the social, political, civil rights role of Anne Spencer. From the 1920s onward, Anne and Edward Spencer were part of the private hospitality network of African Americans, both friends and strangers, who happened to be traveling through Lynchburg and could not stay or eat at the segregated white establishments. While not in the famous printed guides of such places in American cities, the Spencer's house and garden was well known and prized for an upper echelon of visitors. Notable African Americans stayed with the Spencers by circumstance, and then many made a determined pilgrimage to this neighborhood and house, including Langston Hughes, Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Adam Clayton Powell, James Weldon Johnson, Sterling Brown, Thurgood Marshall, Marion Anderson, Zora Neale Hurston, George Washington Carver, Mary McLeod Batum, and the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. We can only imagine the conversations. One of the most important guests was the writer and poet James Weldon Johnson, who had come to Lynchburg on behalf of the NAACP and brought Anne into a more active role in civil rights when he established one of the earliest chapters of that organization in her living room. Anne also campaigned for more black teachers in black schools and became a powerful voice seeking to improve the legal, social, and economic lives of local African Americans. Anne's commitment was, quote, strengthened by what she described as a colossal reserve of constructive indignation. It was while staying with the Spencers that Johnson discovered Anne's poetry there to four written privately for herself. About half of her poems expressed thoughts of nature and her garden, drawing heavily on her Emersonian philosophy. She also admired the work of Robert Browning, John Keats, and Emily Dickinson. Some of her poems served as outlets for her opinions of national and local Jim Crow racism. Johnson encouraged Anne to submit her poems for publication. Her first published work, in 1920, at age 38, appeared in the NAACP journal, The Crisis. Johnson sent one of Anne's poems to his editor, H.L. Mencken, who published it and thus began her public literary life in the Harlem Renaissance with over 30 published poems. Her work appeared in Johnson's book, The Book of American Negro Poetry, 1922, and Alan Locke's book, the New Negro, 1925, and Kunti Collins' book, Caroline Dusk, an Anthology of Verse by Negro Poets, 1927, and her last poem, when she was 67, was published in her good friend Langston Hughes' book, The Poetry of the Negro, which was published in 1949. Most importantly, Anne was the first Virginian and the first African-American woman to be included in the first edition of the Norton Anthology of American Poetry. Anne said of her poetry, I write about things I love. I have no civilized articulation for the things I hate. I proudly love being a Negro woman. It is so involved and interesting. We are the problem, 
the great national game of taboo. Anne's close friend, Langston Hughes, wrote, on Anne's, on Anne Spencer's table, there lies an unsharpened pencil, as though she had left unwritten many things she knows to write. In her book on Anne Spencer's poetry, Nina Salmon commented, to call Anne Spencer a Harlem Renaissance poet is as generic as calling one of her nasturtiums a flower. She was as unique and multifaceted in her field as a nasturtium is in the garden. Anne's reputation was further enhanced by trips to New York City, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, where she cultivated friendships within the Harlem Renaissance, and poetry is just one part of this complex artistic creation for which she is well known. Understanding her poetry in relationship to the garden and the interior of her home is more of an intuitive and sensory experience than something easily defined with layers and layers of interconnected forms and meanings. My first experience with visiting and then recording the Spencer House was from the somewhat straightforward approach of seeing it as an example of the public history venue of the Historic House Museum. I knew from bringing my annual field school participants to the site that it was usually a class favorite, beating out the likes of Monticello and Montpelier with a powerful authenticity. It felt like being in your grandmother's house where she had just stepped out. The stratum of interior finishes was intriguing, but also intimidating to understand. Slowly, the many intersecting layers of furnishings and finishes that reflected the literary and gardening connections stymied my frame of reference. I felt that the micro level of meaning, analyzing the decorative overlays, still required a unique approach. Perhaps I could find an answer to the macro level questions of an African American middle class architecture. Could this site be analyzed in typical fields of vernacular study, or did it need a different ethnic and racial analytical framework? I felt uncomfortable that by suggesting that it needed a different approach, that I was, all right, it's lost the page here. I think it's really lost. So uh, what I'm not going to uh, tell you tonight is the conclusion of, of how the Spencer House fits into the architectural histories of middle class suburban houses and the many other social and cultural subjects related to early 20th century houses. You'll have to wait for the article for that. Uh, Henry Glassy remarked that the ethnographic alternative to familiar experiences in field work would, quote, alert us to what we cannot know when all we have to study is an empty house in ruins. In the case of the Spencer creation, it's the opposite that challenges conventional analysis. The extraordinarily rich visual, literary, and cultural clues that are there to be deciphered. This is not an empty house in ruins, but one empty of translation. If only we could talk to Anne, we could exchange our inadequately parsed understanding with glimpses of her innermost creative impulses. Can we use vernacular studies in Glassy's definition as, quote, one of the tools to use, we use when we face architectural objects with a wish to crack them open and learn their meanings? What seems impossible is to relate the subtle, original, nuanced, and carefully crafted stratigraphic layers of paints, wallpapers, and finishes to the eras of poetry, gardening, or personal events in the life of this remarkable couple. Our tools may still find meaning in this exceptional case of ephemeral cultural landscapes. Glassy's definition of vernacular also meant a transition from the unknown to the known, accommodating cultural diversity, 
It welcomes the neglected into study in order to acknowledge the reality of differences and conflict. Well, this reality of differences seems to be a conflict of judging something that is still considered separate and equal, singular and monolithic. I still grapple with the answers, but this is not my ultimate task. I've raised the questions and noted the challenge as it suggests a different approach from normative vernacular architectural fieldwork and recording and cultural landscapes that still need to be explored. In this particular case, it will require an academic lifetime or two of interdisciplinary work to do justice to this one small place of personal achievement, happiness, and legacy in Lynchburg, Virginia. Thank you. Lights, you turn on the lights. Oh, oh there you go. Okay. Um, and that last part really is a, a plea for a place that is calling out for some master's theses and dissertations. <laughs> this place really has not been truly discovered you could make your career in doing some really good work on at least a half a dozen different subjects at this place. Uh, so if it's not too late to change your thesis topic, uh, <laughs> let me know and I'll help you get started. Uh, so questions? <clears throat> and uh, I should also say we're privileged to have Sean Spencer Hester here, who is Anne's granddaughter who runs the museum now and gives wonderful tours. Uh, and she would also be happy to help you uh, with your academic endeavors. The good news is uh, Anne's papers and library are now over at the small library at UVA. So you could just walk across the street and do research there, but it's a huge amount of material. Uh, so you know, don't wait to get started. Questions? Yeah. Did she ever write about her house and her poetry? Um, and did they ever keep any records of sort of the things that were coming into the house? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, uh, I have not, I admit, I have not gone through all of her papers. Uh, Sean has probably gone through a lot of them, but there's not a lot about the house other than, you know, that Edward is going around town as a postman, picking up parts, and then creatively reusing them. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, the, the garden has been mm, studied to an extent. Her poetry has been studied, but the house, you know, is a, a, a subject waiting for someone else besides me to tackle. Uh, but, you know, you, you have some sense of the challenges here. Uh, I'm still stymied by trying to relate different periods of paint, wallpaper, to other things happening in the house. And maybe that will always be impossible. Uh, you know, restoring it to a period is a challenge. Uh, you know, and Sean has been grappling with that, uh, you know, it's basically the same as the way she left it when she died in 1975. But the bigger stories are all of these changes on floors, ceilings, and walls that were constantly changing uh, based on the garden, uh, based on other things. So, other questions? And even with paint stratigraphy, this is not that easy because some rooms change and other didn't, and it's it's nearly impossible to figure out, you know, which period is is which. Um, but you know, she was into wallpapers 
and you can tell a lot of our wallpapers and, and other decorations were flowers or colors seen in the garden. Uh, but, you know, how do you translate that or poetry, you know, through physical stuff? I mean, it's very intriguing but challenging. Uh, and I, as I said, I'm not going to live long enough to do much more work on it, but some young architectural historian should take it on. <coughs> yeah, in the back? Yeah. And Sean could also answer this, but my feeling is the house and the stuff in it and the parts were, you know, a combination of, of Anne and Edward. Edward might bring something home and they might say, you know, where does it go? But her gardening and her poetry are hers. Uh, you know, her, her little uh, retreat in the backyard is such a special little place. Uh, and uh, you know you you know you get the feeling that uh, you know that was where she kind of did her thinking, her writing. Uh, but uh, also, you know, I have to keep remembering that there were a lot of people there. There were grandchildren. There were children. It's not just Anne by herself. Uh, but, but Sean, do you have any comment on? Uh, how Anne and Edward worked together to do any of the things that we were looking at, the architecture or the garden or the... Yeah, and, you know, it might be possible to look through all her many house and garden magazines to see if there's something that matches something else, but I still think she was doing her own thing uh, with, with the decoration as well as anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ruben. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, uh, uh, and I don't think there's any doubt that Edward built the house with his brothers and built the cottage, uh, but there probably was an ongoing dialogue of, you know, which part goes where and uh, yeah. how to use it. But, um, you know, the, the Spencer family's houses, are there four, Sean? Four on, in that neighborhood. And you can see similarities, you know, uh, for the one next door to Anne's. Uh, but, you know, what always gets me is you just look at this house on the exterior and it just looks like 1903, you know, Queen Anne house. Has, you have no clue as to what's on the inside. Uh, 
or in the in the backyard. Yeah, Sean. And as I said, the part I left out and didn't talk about was trying to put this house and this neighborhood in the bigger context of all the other early houses and neighborhoods that architectural historians have written about over and over and over. I looked and looked and looked. There are very few studies on African-American neighborhoods like this. Um, you know, and I reference a couple in my article, but you know that that became the bigger question. You know, this little neighborhood's part of the American dream, uh, but how does it fit into the big picture? And very few people have have dealt with that subject. Another good thesis topic. <coughs> uh, anyway. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Come come visit. Sean will give you an excellent tour of the house and garden. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.